The year is 1951. These barrels of radioactive waste are being dumped into the Atlantic Ocean, 120 miles from the coast of New York City. The radioactive waste will remain deadly for hundreds of thousands of years, and it is hoped that it will remain isolated from man and the environment at the bottom of the ocean forever. The same operation took place in the Pacific Ocean, 25 miles from San Francisco, just off the Farallon Islands. 25 years later, in 1975, the Environmental Protection Agency decided to find out what became of the barrels of waste. The first exploration was in the Pacific Ocean. The finding? That some of the barrels had leaked and radioactive material had been dispersed to the sea life and in the sediment of the surrounding area. The largest sponge ever seen was found around the barrels. The EPA said it was not a mutation. The report did say that the levels of radioactivity were low and there was no immediate danger. But there is no way of knowing how long all the barrels would last. 85,000 barrels were dumped in all. Ocean dumping is no longer permitted. But today, the unseen emissions from radioactive waste are radiating from land disposal sites around the country. With a huge backlog of waste from the defense program and a growing inventory of waste from the nuclear power industry, the country is continuing to create more waste without knowing what to do with what we already have. The government separates the waste problem into three categories, low level, high level, and an exotic category of man-made elements called transuranic waste. The differences are the degree of radioactivity and the amount of time they remain dangerous. These are some of the radioactive elements that concern people. Strontium-90 can cause bone cancer. It is dangerous for 740 years. Iodine-129 goes to the thyroid gland. It is dangerous for 160 million years. Transuranics are also extremely long-lived and deadly, like plutonium. A speck inhaled can cause cancer, and it is dangerous for 250,000 years. Transuranics exist in both high and low-level waste. At virtually every major waste disposal site, there are problems. It's buried like ordinary garbage in shallow trenches. The containers can be anything from cement to cardboard. Most often, they are barrels. This dumping site in Richland, Washington, is operated by the nuclear engineering company called NECO, a subsidiary of the Teledyne Corporation. NECO operates four of the nation's six commercial burial sites. Most of this waste has a low level of radiation, but mixed in are the dangerous transuranics like plutonium. Because of the dangers, some of the low-level sites no longer accept transuranic waste. The Richland site is very dry, an important factor in picking a location, because water can carry radioactive material into the environment. At dumping sites, Geiger counters are used to measure radioactivity. Water has caused problems at another NECO site in Maxi Flats, Kentucky. Maxi Flats is wet. It receives 55 inches of rainfall a year. In 1975, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, reported that radioactive material had moved off-site and that plutonium and other dangerous material like strontium-90 was found as far as 250 yards away. There are about 130 pounds of plutonium buried there. When Maxi Flats was opened in 1963, it was believed that the material would not move. The report revealed movement had occurred in less than 10 years. There has been some debate as to what caused the migration of radioactive material from Maxi Flats. The EPA suggested it might be from underground leaking from the trenches. 
Nico feels the problem was caused by excess water in the trenches from the heavy rainfall and is pumping the water out. After five years, the job is only half done. What has really happened at Maxi Flats is that some surface contamination due to operational procedures in the water management program and certain sloppiness that occurred in very early years of operation of the site contributed to this off-site contamination. Maxi Flats is not alone in problems or potential problems with low-level waste disposal. At Barnwell, South Carolina, the facility sits 700 feet above an underground reservoir. Should those containers leak, it could endanger the major future source of water for Georgia. At West Valley, New York, some of the trenches have developed leaks. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission was created in 1975 to regulate the nuclear industry. To date, 19 years after the opening of the first commercial nuclear reactor, the government admits it still doesn't know what to do about the problem. I think we're concerned about uh, what we've inherited, if you will, in the NRC with respect to low-level waste uh, across the whole spectrum. Uh, it isn't clear that uh, putting these wastes in a shallow trench and putting dirt over them is a very good long-term solution. That's where we are on low-level waste. Despite the doubts about the safety of the practices, the practices continue as the industry expands. The history of handling radioactive waste has been written by the federal government. Today, 99% of the nuclear waste in this country comes from the defense program, from the atomic bomb to the nuclear submarine. A great deal of that history is buried at the Hanford Reservation in Richland, Washington. This is called a tank farm. The word farm usually means a place where people make things grow. The only thing growing here is the huge amount of high-level radioactive waste from the four government reprocessing plants. The current inventory of high-level government waste at three major installations is 76 million gallons. The Hanford Reservation is a nuclear industrial park with many private and public facilities. It is 570 acres bordering the Columbia River. The facility is operated by the Energy Research and Development Administration, ERDA, which succeeded the Atomic Energy Commission. The waste disposal operation is run by the Atlantic Richfield Hanford Company called ARCO under a contract with ERDA. The ARCO grounds at Hanford are like cemeteries without headstones. Only small pipes mark the colossal graves. The flowers are radiation warning signs. Radiation is the ghost that haunts the atomic graveyard. No one who understands walks around outside the buildings unnecessarily. Here lies the machinery from obsolete plants, a buried mountain of radioactive junk. It is here in a massive underground subway system that the largest amount of high-level waste from the weapons program is stored, 55 million gallons. It is also here that the largest leak of radioactive waste ever occurred in 1973. 115,000 gallons before it was discovered. It is important to understand how it happened. The extremely radioactive waste from reprocessing is liquid and highly acid. At Hanford, the waste is neutralized so that it would not corrode the steel tanks in which it was stored. But the tanks corroded anyway, and that is how that leak and 19 subsequent smaller leaks occurred. The fear is that the wastes could seep into the Columbia River and eventually be carried into the Pacific Ocean with disastrous effects on the environment. Is it true that you really cannot anticipate a leak, that you only know after it happens? Uh, that is correct. We, uh, in order to detect a leak, we must have some leakage from a tank in the first place. So that... Uh, 
by the time you discover it, the damage is done. A small amount of damage is done. It's been reported that you really substantially increased your problem of dealing with large volumes of liquid waste by uh, using a neutralizing process. Are you still using that process? Yes, we still use that process. If you know it created a problem, why don't you change the system? This is the system that we were born with in 1944. Uh, all of our facilities are designed to handle caustic waste. To change it at this point, in view of the fact that we have 152 tanks in place, uh, would be a horrendous problem. Is it fair to say that uh, you are proceeding and intend to remain in operation with a 1940s system that is really obsolete? Um, the... cut or something. I don't, I don't know how to answer. Meanwhile, right now, at the government site at the Idaho Falls Engineering Laboratory, we can get an inside view of a small fraction of the waste that is piling up around the country. Erda is digging up some recent mistakes. Plutonium, buried just seven years ago with ordinary low-level waste, leaked out of its containers and seeped into the ground. It could have become a threat to the water supply for a large surrounding area. Many of the barrels came out bent and damaged. Idaho Falls has the largest quantity of plutonium buried at any one location in the country. About 1,000 pounds of it scattered throughout the site. After the barrels are retrieved, then what? Well, here they stand, crated in white, like technology's mummies waiting for that great permanent repository that has yet to be built. The government estimates it will take $20 billion to clean up the defense waste mess. The cost of handling commercial waste has not been calculated. We are dealing with a threat that no one can see, even when you meet it face to face. The danger is invisible and removed from most people in time and in space by hundreds of years and at least as many miles. The waste increases every minute. The solution of where to put it is years away and none of the previous solutions has worked. We are accustomed in this country to act only in times of crisis. But with nuclear waste, when the crisis comes, it will be too late. This was the nation's first nuclear reactor, opened in Idaho Falls in 1951. It is today a national monument. Ever since man first split the atom, the problems of nuclear power have increased along with its benefits. With new technology, there is often a trade-off between growth and risk. With nuclear power now a part of the nation's energy future, it is important to consider whether the unsolved and little understood problem of nuclear waste should be a limiting factor.